Thank you. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Tal, and I'll be speaking to you about understanding your client. Oh really? I have, yeah. I have one. You have yours. Ah. All right. So I'll be speaking about understanding your client with deep learning, and uh, I guess we'll explain all of those things. I promised the organizer I would say, don't forget to tweet about the talk. Tag me and tag um, uh, Sitbar and SAP Berlin, uh, and spread us on social media. Um, all right. Let's get started. So I guess let's start with the punchline, right? And uh, no presentation is complete without Dilbert. Um, <laughs> so here's the boss saying, hey, we have a gigantic database full of customer behavior information. And Dilbert's like, excellent. We can use nonlinear math and data mining technology to optimize our retail channels. And that's pretty much deep learning, right? We use nonlinear math and data mining to optimize stuff. That's exactly what we want to do. And then oftentimes, I feel as a data scientist and as a consultant that when I talk with my business stakeholders or clients, usually I get something like this. So if that's the same thing as spam, we're having a good meeting here, right? So sometimes the business, as Aaron mentioned, kind of misses um, uh, the business value or what we can really do with these things. And I hope in this talk to kind of show a bit about, maybe we'll talk about the algorithms, but also the potential for how we can interact with our end users within our own organization uh, and kind of expose data that we have but we can't really use at the moment. Um, all right, so I guess at a slightly lower level, what we'll cover today is we're going to talk about text. So when I say understanding, uh, understanding our clients, so I'm a text guy. I work with NLP and mostly uh, with chats. And if you think about it, we, we interact with customers and with other people on email, on chat, on SMS, over the phone, we have transcriptions. And there's a lot of information there, right? So we express the things that we're interested in or our opinion about them. And that's very valuable to know. Um, and then uh, on the other side is we don't just have our customers saying the stuff, we say it, right? So if you have a sales organization and you're holding a CRM, and you have good sales reps at least, they're summarizing their calls and you have information there. What did, what did the customer say to the sales rep? What did the sales rep think about this lead? We want to access that or support tickets, right? So that, I think Darren mentioned that. Sometimes you want to automate your support flow. And you have these tickets that are open, there's text in there, and if you could automate that process based on the content, you'd save a lot of money, you'd optimize it, give better user experience. So these are all things that, when I say it, we want to understand, th th that's what I mean, right? So we really understand the context and text and take actions that help us. Um, kind of uh, more specifically what we'll cover today or the way the rest of this talk will look like is um, I'll tell you a bit about why this is important in general. Um, and then I think I'll break into two parts. So one will be about understanding uh, and the other will be about deep learning, right? So we'll talk a bit about where we are today and what we can and can't do in general in terms of understanding. And then I want to go into the part of deep learning. So deep learning is a wide field in and of itself that has really enabled us to do cool things with text. Um, and then we'll connect them and talk about understanding with deep learning and um, uh, so show, show some practical examples. Great. All right. So who am I, uh, if I didn't uh, say so before, right? Why are you listening to me? I don't work for SAP. I've uh, barely engaged with SAP, I'm uh, ashamed to say. Today, I'm a data scientist consultant at Citibank. Uh, I work with chats. Um, for those of you who are more into text, right, or if you ever consider uh, what a chat or a WhatsApp message looks like. It's really horrible language in the sense that we don't obey rules. We have slang, we have spelling mistakes, we use emojis, right? It's not like you can't read a grammar book, infer the rules of English or German or whatever, and then expect your algorithm to work on chat data because we don't talk like that. That's just wrong. And um, uh, one of the ways we handle that is working instead of assuming that like the atomic unit of text is um, um, a word, we work character by character, right by right. So that's, uh, that's become kind of my day job and my hobby, and uh, I'm very into it. Uh, I like to build stuff. So uh, this tree is, uh, I built this with a friend. It's a four meter tall tree uh, built out of old Coke bottles full of lead lights that we programmed with Bernardino and put in the middle of the desert. So I always like to show it because I'm proud of it. Um, and moving on. All right. So <clears throat> I promise you I'd say, why is this important? Why, sh why should you care? So who here uh, reads XKCD? Very bad. You all should. Say, all right, that's better. Thank you. So XKCD is the ultimate geek comic, right? Uh, this guy, uh, Randall Monroe, I think his name is, and he's very, very smart, and he puts out like a comic weekly. And he's got this one, which is a classic that he put out in 2013. And he's got, you know, the annoying manager comes to the developer, and he's like, when a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a national park. 
And the developer's like, sure, simple, easy GIS lookup, right? So every photo has kind of geographical information in it, so you can just look it up and see, is that a national park or not? And then the manager's like, yeah, and along the way, check whether the photo is of a bird. And then the developer's like, hey, I'll need a research, term, a research team in and five years. And the punchline is, hey, in computer science, sometimes it's hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. And what I want you to notice is this came out in 2013. And the, the camera wrote is like, wow, recognizing a bird in a picture is virtually impossible. Okay, that was the state of the art four years ago. But last year, what we were able to do is this, right? So we can take pictures of a bird, and not only can we recognize there's a bird in there, but the algorithm will actually label, it, label the picture for us in proper English, right? Two birds sitting on top of a tree branch. So think about the complexity of understanding of the image. It recognized the bird, it recognized uh, the tree branch, it understood that the bird is sitting on the tree branch, it can count one, two, even though it counts wrong, there's a third bird there. But. And then it can take all of that information and generate a sentence. So three years ago, recognizing a bird was impossible. And last year, we can do this and it's like easy. You know, you can download it on GitHub and it works. So I, I think that when things go from being absolutely impossible to absolutely trivial in three years, we should pay attention because there's a lot we can probably do with this. And yes, moving on. So uh, let's talk a bit about what we can't do. And this handsome gentleman over here is Peter Norvig, uh, maybe, I think he's touched all of our lives in the sense that he was head of search at Google and uh, he's at some senior research position there. And many years ago, before I was born in 76, he wrote a PhD and the title of the PhD was called The Unified Theory of Inference for Text Understanding. And I bring, I bring this up because, first of all, it's really cool to bring old stuff, right? It's like tip theory. Uh, but second, he, he made a very interesting observation in his PhD. It kind of he says, what, what do I want? So let me just read this. This is the first page uh, of his thesis. And he says, people are very good at interpreting text and making inferences. They generally do not notice when the text is underspecified and they have to make inferences to resolve ambiguities or to gain a fuller understanding of the text, right? So said more easily, hey, I can tell you something and even if I leave out details, it's really easy for you to kind of complete them, right? Like, uh, hey, I'm in Berlin, right? Everyone understands I'm in Berlin, Germ Germany, and not Berlin, Massachusetts, right? That's easy for you, but for the computer, not so much. So he brings this really awesome example and says four things we want to be, be able to do with it, right? And this is just a short paragraph um, uh, from a fairy tale, and the whole PhD is about this paragraph, right? It's mind blowing. Um, so he's like, uh, the story goes in a poor fishing village built on an island not far from the coast of China, a young boy named Chang Li lived with his widowed mother. Every day, Little Chang bravely, bravely set off with his net, hoping to catch a few fish from the sea, which they could sell and have a little money to buy bread. And, okay, so that's the paragraph that makes sense, right? There's a boy, he lives on an island, there's a sea, he's brave, he goes with a net and, you know, catch fish to sell, right, so they have money for bread. Wonderful. Now, as readers of the text, here are a few things that are kind of obvious to us, right? There is a sea, okay, because that's in the text, and it is used by the villagers for fishing. And the sea surrounds the island, and it's part of the coast of China, right? So that was obvious. Anyone not pick up on that? Excellent. Okay. Chang intends to trap fish in his net, which is a fishing net, right? So obviously that's a fish. Did anyone hear this story and think that was a butterfly net? No. But if, it, if you think about a computer, you know, it doesn't have the information to infer that. Uh, and then, two, so those are two tasks that are very, very difficult and we can't do. And then two tasks that today we can do very, very well. Uh, the word which, in which they could, in which they could sell, so uh, where is it? Uh, catch a few fish from the sea, which they could sell. Uh, so the word which refers to the fish and not to the sea, because grammatically you could parse the sentence and understand that you know the thing that they're going to sell is the sea. Uh, so we want to be able to tell the difference between that. So today we can, we're quite good at that. And the final one, the same concept, is uh, the word they. Okay, so. Point being from this slide is there are some things that are today we're quite good at, such as resolving, you know, what does they refer to, and some things that we're completely lost at and we have, uh, it's just like hopeless or very frustrating, at least as a, as a practitioner, right, which is understanding kind of context and making inferences that for a human are, are, are trivial, but for a computer are still impossible. Um, so yeah, things are very bad in that sense.
but we can do a bunch of really cool stuff, okay? So here, here's a list of things that we do really well today. So translation, if uh, any of you use Google Translate, uh, you may have noticed in the last year that the results really, really jumped. Um, Google published a few papers uh, and about what they've done. They say that in the last year of work using neural networks for translation, they've made more improvements than they made in the last 10 years. And you can see examples online of the, the difference in quality of the translation, and it's, it's quite astonishing. Um, even to give a, a little anecdote there, they trained a, a toy system, or kind of a crazy example system, where they taught it to do translations from English to Korean and from Korean to Japanese. And then without showing it any examples, they got the system to do English to, Japane to, English to Japanese direct, right? So it would do an intermediate representation by itself and go without having to train it on that particular translation. So that's pretty cool. Uh, other things we want to do, entity recognition. So this is my like professional bread and butter, right? The user, um, I don't know, he talks in a text and you want to understand he's talking about this product and he's talking about this person, right? Maybe we want to know when we're mentioned on Twitter by name and not by handle. So we need an algorithm that can recognize that, that's entity recognition. Uh, sentiment analysis, does the customer like this? Is the support he's getting happy? Does he you know, hate this product? Does he think this particular attribute is wonderful and we should amplify it in our marketing? Um, imputation, so this is, I guess, n not a very common task in, in industry, but sometimes you have missing data, right? Maybe you did a transcription of a sales call and the transcription isn't perfect and you need to fill in missing words. So how do you do that, right? Um, and we can, and it works quite well. Uh, dependency parsing is boring, so I won't talk about it, but maybe what's important is um, this stuff's hard. And the reason is it's hard, as I said before, is because the rules of language are ambiguous. So even if, um, if you have a good understanding of grammar, you're a trained linguist, still the, the rules are difficult. There are a lot of subtle points and, and, and um, outlier cases, etc. But uh, that doesn't even matter because people don't follow them, right? So I think I have decent English and I've probably made 100 grammatical mistakes since I started speaking. Subtle things in pronunciation and grammar. And w we all do that, especially when we write, especially when we write informally. Um, it, it, we're just, we don't obey the rules. It, it, so we can't build a system that follows the rules and expect it to work, right? And finally, and this is a fact of life that's very unfortunate as a data scientist, but all data is dirty, right? So data gets stored, the engineer that's storing it does a crappy job of it, we don't define it well, right? There's noise in the signal for whatever reason, and in the end, uh, the data's junk or semi-junk, and that's a fact of life, and we have to deal with that, right? So you can't say the data is junk and we won't have product. The data is junk and we need to deliver. Um, but we need, to, we need to be able to, I guess, prepare ourselves uh, spiritually for the frustration, and then also have algorithms that can actually handle that or work with it. Um, yeah, questions so far? Excellent. So let's move on to the deep learning part, okay? So that's kind of our background and understanding. And uh, to kick it off, I want to kind of compare, I would call it old school machine learning and deep learning. And I think I if you consider what goes on when you do machine learning, so these algorithms that we were talking about before, um, you need to push in features into that. You need to the machine, look at this, this, and this, right? So the housing price, the housing size, and, um, and, and from that predict something. And if you think about tasks that aren't numerical inherently, so maybe recognizing a logo or recognizing a face, recognizing an engine in a picture, these are good examples, what are you putting in the algorithm, right? It just takes in numbers, so uh, uh, what are you putting in there? And one of the things that we traditionally did in computer vision was this, th this nice guy, this is called the Sobel operator, and this star means convolution for anyone who remembers one-dimensional convolutions from calculus, so this is the, the, the expansion. Uh, if you like computer science, it's equivalent to the, uh, to some manipulation of the Fourier transform. Very boring. Um, and what the Sobel operator does is it takes a picture and it finds the, uh, the line. So it kind of highlights where the edges are of an object. And from that, we can come, all right, there's something here, right? We just get the borders. So that's great, because now we have a feature that's a bit more usable for object recognition. But it's still not very clear what we're gonna do with this thing, right? Once we went from here to here, on the one hand, we have a better representation and we still need to do a lot of work to keep doing it. Now, the other thing is that Sobel, for which the Sobel operator is named, was very smart. 
And he figured out the sobo operator. But, and this is an unfortunate fact of life, most of us are dumb. And we're not going to figure out the sobo operator. Um, and so we won't get these wonderful features. Um, so here's what deep learning does for us, right? It's like, you don't need to be smart like Sobel. I'll do it for you. And basically, deep learning is you stick in raw data, or very close to raw data, and you have all your millions and hundreds of billions of parameters. And what, what the network does fundamentally is learn various layers of representations of your data, right? And those representations are exactly the relevant features. So if you think about Facebook, right? We all have Facebook, and it recognizes our faces in pictures and says, tag this person, right? How does it do that? How does it know who I am? So that's exactly with deep learning. And what goes on is you feed it the picture, and it has this neural network, and the lowest layers learn these really basic features. So these kind of lines, right? Little curves, maybe differences in color, but things that are very, very local. The next layer, we'll look at collections of these, right? and learn something a bit more sophisticated. So maybe an eye or an ear, right? These basic shapes. And you keep stacking those up, and eventually you end up with something that can recognize a face, right? So say person or not person. And eventually can recognize Tal and be really creepy. But the beauty is that you don't have to hand engineer features, right? You don't have to tell it, all right, if you see this particular shape, it's a nose. And if you see this particular shape, it's an eye. And you know, if you have someone who's missing an eye, what does your algorithm do? The network handles it for you, and and then you don't have to do this, and that's really great. Um, yes, good. All right, so that's all nice and good, but so far, like the, the problems we've talked about the, the, the are either numerical or image. But I promised you I would talk about text. So what is deep learning given us for text? And I would say two two fundamental things. All right. So one is the ability to handle. Uh, inputs of arbitrary size. So if you think about it, right, we'll have a collection of chats or documents or whatever, and some of them will be really short, like that's great, and some of them will be very, very long, like, hi, I'm a customer based in Berlin, and I ordered your product, and I was very frustrated because support was terrible, and blah, 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 and this thing can go on forever. And you want to have an algorithm that can take any sized input, and sometimes also, say in translation, right, um, translate to variable-sized outputs. Um, and we didn't have a good way to do this before. So we had, um, well, let me get, get the other point, then I'll say the trade-off. The other thing we want to do is when we look at, at text of varying scales, we want to capture dependencies that are very local. So high i, and i, you know, high is an address, and i, the relation between them is very, very immediate. And then if we have a document, and I talk about myself once in the beginning and once at the end, we want to somehow resolve that that's the same object, right? We want to capture the very long-term dependencies in there. And until deep learning came about, we really didn't have a good way to do both of these, to handle arbitrary input lengths, and particularly long input lengths, and on the other hand, capture the dependencies at kind of an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary length. And that makes a really big difference when you're working with text, because you know, the dependencies and the lengths are arbitrary. They're really up to your user. You have no control over it. Um, all right, so let's see how we do that. This is the technical slide, all right? Um, by the way, it, l let me ask this. How many people, when I say gradient, think of colors? OK, um, good. So I, I won't go too deep into the gradients, but the, uh, and how many people hate Python? Shame. OK, so basically, the, the, the core construct, or the, the, I don't know, the type, or whatever you want to call it, in deep learning that allows us to work with text or sequences in general, this works for prices and temperatures and whatever, um, it's called a recurrent neural network. And basically a recurrent neural network, it, it, put simply, it's this box A. This is the code inside of it. And what A is, it's basically a state machine. But it, instead of having finite states and kind of a trend, how do I transition from this to this, it has these soft states. They're, they're these vectors, they're these bizarre continuous numbers. and what we train the network to do is learn how to move, given an input, how to move from state to state. But the beauty is, if you look at it, like I can input here, and every time I give the box A an input, it does two things. On the one hand, it gives an output, like every good box, right? Boxes should get inputs and give us outputs. But on the other hand, it does this little loop thingy where it updates its internal state. So that means that when I give it, I don't know, I say, hi, I am, then when it considers the output for the second word, it's 
taking it into account the context that came before it, right? And then a as I move down the sentence, every time I give an output, or I, I, the box gives an output, it does it with the context of everything that came before it. And that's quite nice because this is exactly what we wanted. We can, using this box, we can put in arbitrary length inputs, right? We can have one example with two words and one example with a thousand words and both work. And the th thing promises us to capture the dependencies, the, the long-term and the short-term dependencies within the inputs we have. And that gives us uh, what we want. Now, ah, let's skip this, right? So it gets very complicated very fast. There are all sorts of like uh, wacky architectures. Where's the clock? How much time do I have? I can't see it. Ah, okay, so let's talk about this. I have enough time. Um, all right, so um, let's come back to it. Let's do something simpler first. Okay, so let me show you a really nice example that I like of these things in action. Um, so this is from a guy named Andre Karpate. He's today the head of research at Tesla. And at the time he, did, he wrote this, it was a, he was a PhD student at Stanford. Um, but basically, he took this box, and what he told it to do was he, he took the Linux source code, all right, all the source code of the Linux kernel, and he fed it in character by character into this box A. And what he asked the network to do was given a character, or given a sequence of characters, predict the next one, okay? And he just, trained, he just trained it to predict the following character given an input. Great. So once you have that, you know, you can feed it a character. It'll predict the next character. You can take that prediction and feed it back into the network, right? So it'll, you know, you put in A, it'll say B. You take B, you put it back in, and um, it'll give you C. And you put that back in. And all right, so that's what he did. But he trained it on the Linux kernel. So then this is code that a, not a person wrote. This is something that a machine wrote, exactly based on his output. Now. That, that's cool, right, because it looks nice, but it has a few really interesting properties. So first of all, it understands comments, right? You open a comment block, you close a comment block. And there, there's a long range here, right, because there, there, I don't know, there's probably 60 characters between the opening of the comment and the closing of the comment, right? And the machine's capturing, all right, right now I'm in comment state. I can't continue into code mode before I close my comment. So that's pretty cool. And then it understands function declarations, right? You know, it's static, and I know it's int, and then I need to be, and then I know, uh, I don't know, what does my function take? I think it's bad practice to say uh, your function takes void, but I don't know, I haven't written C in a while. Um, all right, but here's the thing that, in my opinion, is, is really the most mind-blowing, all right? Follow the, the indentations, because um, look, he, he opens the function, right? So everything's indented within the first curly brace, and then he opens this if, so everything's indented in there, and then he opens the, his, this, this if, and it remembers if it's one line if, then you don't open curly braces, right? So that's the code standard in Linux. Um, but it does the indentation again, the same for the else. Now, what's kind of amazing here is that um, this thing's captured dependencies in multiple layers, right? It knows, hey, I'm in one layer deep of indentation, two layers deep, and it knows to unwind them correctly. And if you think about how we would implement that, so maybe how a parser does that, it, it, has a, it follows a stack, right? So all right, stacks aren't that complicated, but the network learned to stack by itself. And that's amazing because, you know, we had to read uh, books in computer science courses to know what a stack is. And this thing just figured it out by itself. And that, and that exactly gives us the ability to, to track these long-term dependencies in our text, which is, Again, very, very cool. Questions? Yes? It, it, it couldn't quite make, make up its mind of the web page opening curly brace. What? Is it mind or something you have? Uh, no, I, th I think that it's the convention of the link source code that function declarations have a uh, different line and if blocks uh, on the same, right? But this is a, a, a contested uh, standard. Right. That's what what was the one line if did? Excuse me? No, why? Where did it cheat? Right, you're right. You're absolutely correct. So, right, it loses points for that. Absolutely. <laughs> huh? It has a go-to. Yeah. Well, I think they have go-tos. <laughs> so th this is th this tells you something, right? They have go-tos in the Linux kernel because it didn't invent C. It only learned from example. So if the Linux people are writing go-tos, then you know, so are we apparently. 
Anything else? So that could be, but Linux particularly has a very um, assertive dictator and a very consistent uh, coding style because of that. Um, right. um, great. So let's talk. I want to show you two use cases, and then we have, uh, I guess, time for questions. Um, so this is from a, start a Berlin startup named Raza. And you know, everyone here, I'm sure, has been hearing about chatbots and how awesome they are. Right? It's a big buzzword, but honestly, chatbots suck because they don't work. Um, but Ra Raza is building tooling to make it better. And uh, I met with the guys because you know we like tech, so we were chatting. And then they showed me this really cool pilot they did. And I'm like, wow, that, that's an awesome example. So basically, they hooked up with an insurance company. And this insurance company had like a long tail of customers whose policy was about to expire. But they didn't really have the capacity to call them one by one. And so these Raza guys built a bot that you know would send an SMS, like any normal company would, right? Send an SMS to your clients, they renew. But then they built a bot that can follow the full conversation in SMS to get them to renew their insurance policy. And the really cool thing is they got a 25% renewal rate, which is amazing because you don't have human labor. You know, you paid, they paid the other guys whatever they paid, but they got a 25% renewal rate on this long tail and this reusable product. And that's fantastic, right? Because because it works, that's valuable, right? I don't think I need to upsell it any more than that. Um, all right, and the other thing is, and this is again my bread and butter. Um, you want to understand what customers are saying about you, about your product, right? What do they care about? So, th uh, so this is a project I'm doing with a friend, um, where we want to go through Amazon reviews and understand what are the key features that people are talking about in products to see, you know, what matters. And, and that's not well defined, right? It's not like you said person, product, right? So you have these attributes like, uh, uh, I don't know, this is about jumper cables, long cable, okay? So that's an attribute. And then it's built solid, it's nice and tough, it's big, it's hard. So um, you wanna capture these things and then you move on to a different domain like books or movies, then you get these, uh, these other attributes, you need to capture them. And I annotated this by hand, right? Like I had sat down and dragged the mouse and this is horrible, horrible, horrible work. And you really don't want to do that. And it's expensive, even if you outsource it, right? If you outsource it cheaply, you get bad results because cheap labor gives cheap outcome. And if you outsource it to experts, it's very, very expensive. So you want to automate this as fast as possible. And this is a, an area where deep learning, or these techniques are particularly useful because these words, they have meanings based on their context, right? So if we can understand the, the global dependencies or the area that's surrounding the words of interest, we can make much more clever inferences about them uh, than we could. And then the, the use cases downstream is, you know, we can populate our CRM with things that our customers are interested in. We can understand what people are saying about our products and where we should focus our marketing efforts or our product development efforts. So there's a lot of very, very relevant and important information in this text. And the beauty is a lot of companies have it, right? Like we, companies interact with people via text and it's there, we saved this stuff for years. Uh, and now we kind of have the tooling um, uh, to access that information. Um, so, wrapping up, uh, right? As I said, we, are, we as companies, we have text records of our interactions with our customers or of ourselves, whatever. And we can use those records to better serve our clients and ourselves, optimize our business, optimize our products, whatever. And text is really, really hard, right? We saw, we don't really know what we're doing. Norvig said it in 76, and we still haven't gotten much better. But deep learning makes it a little bit easier because we can capture uh, long range dependencies and because we don't have to do feature engineering anymore. And uh, with that, uh, thank you. It's a bit intense, huh? Uh, questions? How much has the attention of analysis brought you guys? Because you know, the, from, from the verdict standpoint, you're the query creator, you know, the massive tool that you have to deal with. What kind of analysis do you do? Because it seems to be the most strong. Uh, so the state of the art is, is constantly moving forward. The, I would say the problem 
with asking these questions on text as opposed to image, for images, the answers are very clear, right? In the domain, a bird is a bird is a bird is a bird is a bird, right? And what's going to change is the type of bird and the quality of the image. And I think sen sentiment is a little bit harder to define. Sometimes um, um, I have an example that I took out, unfortunately. So sometimes you'll have a sentence like, uh, there's a classic example on Amazon reviews, right? Where they're reviewing a, a, a movie that was a book adaptation. And the reviewer is saying, wow, the book is really, really good. The movie is horrible. What's the sentiment of the review, right? And so you need to drill down into the sentiment of the d particular object he's talking about. And then these things break down a bit. Make sense? On the other hand, though, I will, I will say that in terms of standard, standard tasks uh, that are defined, kind of ac academics are tracking, then uh, there's new state of the arts being hit all the time with this stuff. Sure. More? Mm. So it's sort of like judging images in three dimensions. Um, but it's a question, so do you primarily work with three D printers or some other ranges as well? Or what might be the difficulties in other ranges of the things you work on with three D printers? All right. So um, I work with a mix. So my focus is English because you know, that's I guess just the language that business is done in. Um, um, then you have so languages like German, German's, German's amazing, right? Because German uh, breaks all the rules of linguistics, right? Like you have all these phenomena like Trenbauer verbs, right? You have these phenomena in German that they just don't make sense and all the linguistics will say that's wrong, right? That shouldn't happen in a language. So German's really, and the ability to, um, German's funny in the sense that you can take uh, a bunch of words and connect them, right? So where does a word start and where does it end? How should you split it? So that that's, an interesting phenomenon. There are languages that are more extreme in that, that um, the, the atomic unit of writing uh, might be a syllable, um, or maybe in Chinese we don't even have spaces, right? So then when exactly does a word start and when does it end and how are they interacting? That's an um, uh, interesting example. In Hebrew, my native language, um, we don't have vowels. So I saw um, um, an interesting example, uh, it was funny, right? But the, um, the word for massacre and cook, like the person, the chef, is spelt the same. Um, and uh, the news article, someone said it was something about a, a massacre in, and someone commented, you know, stupid uh, people, why are you listening to a chef instead of uh, the police, right? Um, so every language has its own kind of funny phenomena. Yeah. Um, things like sentiment analysis. How do you defend against uh, bias in something like that? Because it strikes me as kind of a problem in today's. Uh, well, uh, it, it it's a question of do you need to right? So if you're using internal tools, j bias is a fact of the of the data, and you know that who cares. Uh, right, it, it depends on the time. If you're Facebook and you're doing something consumer facing and it's going to be a PR fiasco, then that's a big problem. Um, but well, on the internal data, you know, suppose you're using it to guide a recruitment system, right? To, you may have a cultural bias towards white males, for instance. Yes, that's your, your data is a problem. Is that what yeah, yeah, that, that, that's I think that, that's generally true, right? You're only going to get the you're going to get results that reflect your data if the process that generated your data is is biased in some way so bias kind of in the negative connotation of i don't know we we like white males or bias just um uh, i don't know there's some statistical bias there then your system's going to reflect it and then the first thing you need to do in order to to prevent that is know about it right and you're not going to be able to defend against that if you're not aware of the problem and once you are then you can usually rebalance your data in some form to get kind of the distribution you're looking for so um I think th there was an automated system for granting parole in the States that was very, very biased. And um, uh, eventually they went into correcting it uh, exactly for these reasons, right? Anything else? Yeah? So what's the story then? If, if, if it works so much, then it may be very useful. And if I get that right, the core question is, is is it too simplistic and is it too deep learning? Uh, right. So all right, so, so before deep learning became big, support vector machines were like the, the, the yeah, so what's beautiful about like, 
and it's really nice about them. So the classic machine learning now are like logistic regressions. They're linear classifiers, so that means like the example is that you should you have your data points and you can only draw a straight line. You're always looking for like clever ways to draw a straight line. What support vector machines can do is they have this clever trick um, where you can kind of make believe that your data is in some different geometry, right? Kind of, but it's all make believe. It doesn't really happen. Like you don't have to compu compute it. But then instead of having to separate with a straight line, you can separate it with this crazy zigzag, right? And the algorithm will find it. And that's why they were the state of the art. And my girlfriend bought me this shirt because, you know, she thought, you're a geek, you like this stuff. <laughs> so here you go. And I like it. And it's always nice to wear it when I talk about neural networks. Anything else? Yeah, so, so, so there's a really cool site online called, I forgot its name, but so this guy did an experiment, he's like a, very much like the example I showed with C code, and he was like, can I learn to make clickbait, right? He's like, basically, look, I'll train on like BuzzFeed titles and articles, I'll make a bunch of clickbait, I'll get a bunch of Google traffic, I'll put ads there and I'll make a bunch of money, you know, generating content uh, automatically is a smart idea, and he does that. So the, the, the titles he gets are really good, like they're funny, they, they're witty, they make sense, but kind of on a longer term, like a paragraph, we still are terrible at, like it doesn't make sense. The, the grammar is correct, like you can read it and say, this sentence is correctly phrased, but it doesn't make any logical sense, and there's definitely no like proper sense between two sentences, or definitely two paragraphs, right? We're very, very far from that. Okay, thank you.